This time, law enforcement officers compete in a match that's really street smart training. Plus the Colt 1877, now one of history's guns. And handgun silhouette reaches out to rifle distances. This is Shooting USA, reporting the stories of America's shooting sports. It's the result of a need the NRA recognized eight years ago that the nation's police officers rarely get the training they need for the dangers they encounter on the street. The answer, the Tactical Police Competition, or TPC. It's three-gun competition limited to duty gear for local, state, and federal law enforcement officers. They compete with the gear they carry on the streets while running through scenario-based courses of fire, scenarios they may face on the job. The scenario, an officer responds to a jewelry store robbery call, but trips on the sidewalk outside the shop. Shoot it, this time go ahead and take a deep breath. His duty gun is a few feet away, and so is a threat just beyond the orange mesh. It is training, under pressure, and it's also a competition. Only military and law enforcement officers are here with their retention holsters, duty handguns, patrol rifles, and shotguns running through unique courses of fire. This is tactical police competition. It's great trigger time. We need more and more of it in law enforcement, um, and we just don't get enough of it. And it puts us in situations where we're having to move with our guns, not just standing there static, shooting at a qual target. So the training value alone is, is excellent. The Fairfax County Police Department has been host to these matches since the NRA created them nearly eight years ago. And it's grown in popularity. This match is a sellout with 120 officers from 50 agencies across the nation. Suzanne Marsteller from the Naval Criminal Investigative Service, the famous NCIS, is one of them. And she's also one of three women competing in the match. You're welcome with open arms when you show competency and, and confidence. Um, the guys are great. It's great competition. Um, it's kind of fun to be able to put them in their place whenever they need it. So it, it's a really good time. Yeah, I encourage other females in law enforcement, anybody, to come out here and have a good time and, and use it as a challenging you know, and training tool. Competition that doubles as training. And it is this training that could help save lives in the field. That is the vision of the NRA law enforcement competition manager, Mark Lipp. Most of my staff are retired law enforcement, so we're seeing our brothers and sisters, and we know that we can help them make a difference in either saving their life or going back and training their officers from their department to save their lives or our citizens that we serve. So it's really exciting. Mark Lipp is a retired deputy chief who designed tactical police competition with the officer in mind, and that is reflected in the scoring system. All courses of fire are timed and scored in seconds. The same goes for each target zone. So we started with a target and designed it around the human torso, where do, where do shots have to go to eliminate that immediate threat? Not to kill people, but to stop that forward aggression. So instead of different scoring zones, we actually call them loss of accuracy penalties. Only the two best hits are scored. No penalty for hits in the center of mass, but a hit in the two zone is a two second penalty. A hit in the four zone adds four seconds. Just missing a threat target is a 40 second penalty. And hitting a no shoot target representing an innocent bystander also adds penalty points. Most of the civilian shooting sports, it's all about speed, speed, speed. Well, that's not law enforcement. We're looking for the accuracy first, speed second. There are lots of curveballs in tactical police competition, which demonstrate uncertain situations officers may face in the field. So on this rifle-only stage, officers must start by taking cover under a patrol car 
as if a gunman has just blown out the windshield. Like most of the shootings, you definitely don't want to be in the wide open. You want to get behind the cover or concealment and also you know, shoot from a position that is more secure than a wide open place. This stage is appropriately named Exploding Windshield, and officers are about to face an additional challenge, a malfunction. Range officers hide a dummy round in every magazine, forcing officers to tap and rack, tap the magazine to seat it in place, rack the bolt to clear the dummy round. Officers know it's coming, they just don't know when. It's always a little bit of a shock, but when they tell you it's there, you're kind of waiting for it. Luckily, Pamela Jewelhart recovers quickly with her department's new upgrade, a Colt M4 carbine topped with a red dot optic. And the combat optic is a step up from her old patrol rifle with iron sights. It's just more tactically sound. It's just, it's a lot quicker to acquire your target. Um, especially with all the active shooters going on nowadays, it's good to be equipped and you know, you don't want to be outgunned by the bad guys. So I think a lot of the agencies are going to, you know, just the more tactical weaponry. The NRA allows both iron sights and optics in competition as more departments switch to advanced sighting systems. Either way, both are put to the test thanks to the stage designer who continues to challenge officers in competition to prepare them for the unpredictable world they protect. They'll joke around like, oh, that was really hard. Why'd you make me shoot this and want to do that? By the end of the day, of course, they're stone tired, as you've seen. They're just going, this is the greatest stream we've ever had. When we hear that, we know we've done our job. It's a long-standing tradition in action shooting with a timer and a scorecard. Training is not only fun, it also comes much closer to simulating real-life drama on the streets. Well, coming next, the officer who says TPC competition is adding tools to his toolbox. And a look at the firearm tools of the trade. Introducing the M&P M2.0 by Smith & Wesson, enhanced for complete shootability. Featuring a new aggressive grip texture, the famous M&P Optimal Grip Angle. Four interchangeable palm swell grips for nearly any hand size. A light, crisp trigger with a clear tactile reset. Everything you love about the M&P pistol made even better. The new M&P M2.0, advanced by design. Shooting USA is brought to you by the M&P by Smith & Wesson, advanced by design. When you meet the officers shooting the tactical police competition, you find experienced officers keeping their skills sharp and younger officers training for the confrontation they hope never comes. You also find the choice of patrol firearms are frequently decided by the department, but more and more are left to the individual officer's choice. Sergeant Robert Kamensky is no stranger to dangerous encounters. We've dealt with active shooters before. Um, we've had uh, the Discovery Center bombing was in our jurisdiction. And we also had the um, uh, Mohammed and Malva, the Beltway snipers, originated in our jurisdiction. Kamensky has been protecting and serving the people of Montgomery County in Maryland for 28 years. And he continues to test himself through quality training with the firearms he carries on the job. It's important for me because I think the, um, the stress of competition is something that helps you when you're out working on the road. Uh, I shoot a uh, Smith & Wesson M&P and I shoot a Winchester shotgun. Our department carries Glocks, but the you know, striker fired M&P is very similar to a Glock. I just like the, the feel of it better in my hand. I like the grip, the way it feels. I like the trigger pull a little bit better and that's probably just, just preference, I think. The more training you do, the more different circumstances that you're exposed to, I think it just gives you um, more tools in your toolbox, so to speak, to kind of go into a situation and not just have one solution. So Kamensky and dozens of officers are sharpening those tools at the tactical police competition in Virginia. One of the challenges competitors face at this officer-only match 
is a skill-based course of fire focusing on accuracy, firearms handling on the move, and agility. Officers can only shoot in the firing area marked in yellow. Plus, officers have just three minutes to complete the stage. This is course three. It's a skill-based course. Brent Smith is an officer at home in Texas, but a volunteer range officer today. All right, range is clear. Walking us through the demands of this two-gun stage, pistol and shotgun only. Handgun loaded and holstered, starting with heels on start line. On the start signal, you can draw, come to either of these three ports. On this port, you have two head plates, one mini popper. The head plates must mark to count. They will not fall. The mini popper must fall. There's some very tough and tight shots in this stage. It makes you think because you have to remember certain target arrays in certain areas. It also uh, challenges you on the shotgun, loading on the move and engaging targets on the move. The officers retrieve their loaded shotgun from the barrel for two more steel targets and nine clays. Once the shotgun is dumped, officers engage six paper targets with their handgun, not the ones painted white. You must remain within this firing area and maneuver through and around these no-shoot targets. If you step out of the firing area or knock over one of the no-shoot targets, it's a 10-second procedural. Once you enter into the doorway, you have other targets to engage. That's pretty much it. This is Reagan Rafferty's first tactical police competition. He's an officer with a small department in Pennsylvania, one of 14 officers in total. But everyone is fully equipped with whatever they want. I'm shooting Glock 17 today. Glock 17 Gen 4. I have a T uh, Streamlight TLR 1HL light on it. I put Ameriglow straight eight style sights. My department's pretty, pretty good about whatever you shoot best with is what you carry. Reagan's Mossberg 930 SPX is also his choice for extreme situations. The idea behind a shotgun, it is, it is made to be run very rough. The harder that you actually run it, the more rough you are pretty much with the weapon itself, the better it'll perform, the harder you can run with it. Because in those high stress situations and things like that, fine muscle memory kind of goes, goes right out the door. You want to be able to do something that's rough, easy to remember, gross muscle movements that just translate better into the firearm. Creating muscle memory and perfecting proficiency, the skills officers need to protect the public and themselves. All these skills, they're directly transferable. I mean, it's the kind of thing where you hope to never have to use a firearm or anything like that while working, but if you have to, you better be good at it. You better be good at it. And that's equally good advice for those of us who aren't officers, but carry concealed. And still ahead, training to stop European jihad in a street side cafe. The stage called, and you never thought it would happen here. What makes a legacy? Is it quality? Craftsmanship? Maybe it's the idea that every American deserves their right to security and peace of mind on and off the battlefield. What makes a legacy? Here at Colt, we're making it every day. Colt. Built one at a time, proven every round. Shooting USA is brought to you by Hornady. Accurate, deadly, dependable, and by Bushnell Performance Optics. For concealed carry civilian training, the sport is IDPA with scenarios like being robbed at an ATM. But for tactical police competition, the scenarios involve active shooters like the stage, and you never thought it would happen here. A band of jihadis shooting up a street side cafe. Shots have been reported at a local upscale cafe at the town center. Before backup arrives, you hear several gunshots from the outside seating area. 
hear screaming and people come running around the corner towards your position. Before you can yell commands at them, you see a gunman dressed in all black. As you begin to raise your rifle, one sees you and starts to take aim. It is a scenario all too familiar in Europe. Jihadis attacking Western civilization. Course name is you never thought it would happen here. As in a true response, officers go into this course without knowing nine other threats are beyond the double doors. This is a limited walkthrough stage. You are not allowed to walk past or look past that second set of doors, okay? But Range Officer Ryan Post gives us a look. They have to use their patrol rifle ammunition, 28 rounds first, and then if they run dry, they can finish the course with their handgun. You can't really game this stage because it's a limited walkthrough. Oh, Lord. But there's another catch. Once officers are out of ammo, they must transition to their handgun using their sling. But if officers don't have one, well, that's another challenge. They're gonna have to do one-handed shooting. That's tough for everybody, including myself. Jason Perry is about to practice that discipline today. I left my sling in my truck and I'm Kind of upset about it now, but shot a lot more pistol rounds than I planned on, and there were one-handed shots, and I ended up missing a couple. But it's in the end, it's all good training because you never know what can happen in a in a gunfight. You may sling may break or whatever, it may have to hold your rifle, and so it was all good training, good good learning experience. And it's proof this competition works, forcing officers to make decisions on the fly, and even some mistakes. Well, a lot of it's pretty challenging, and uh, a lot of these situations, uh, for instance, I just missed a target. I went through a room, passed the target, and it's better to do that in training than do that in a real operation, because uh, obviously that could have cost myself or my teammate his life. Uh, but in a training situation, now it's a mistake that I don't see myself making in the future. I'm a SWAT team officer with a major city's police department in the D.C. area. Um, I'm part of the entry team, and I'm also a sniper with the team. But today, Kevin Lally is practicing entry work with his Colt M4. It's a, got a 10 and a half inch barrel. It's uh, shortened for entries. It has fully automatic capability, although uh, the use of that is pretty limited, dependent on the situation. Um, I've been shooting NRA law enforcement competitions for the last eight years. Um, I use it as a training experience. Um, it's challenging, and it's uh, stuff that sometimes my department just can't afford to do. So I seek it out on my own. Um, you know, being a cop isn't an eight hour job where you can just check in and check out. A lot of our training is uh, done in our own personal time. It's training that these officers take seriously. But of course, some also take winning seriously too. I'm, I'm here to compete and win, I'll, I'll say that. Or, or try to win, I should say that. Quang Bowie is no stranger to tactical police competition. But this time he's shooting it with a head camera and his own gear, which still qualifies as duty gear under the TPC rules. I'm using a uh, Blackhawk Serpa holster, level two, with the uh, with the push button, which is um, you know separate from my uh, my duty gear. Um, you know we use a, a Safari Land level three, and actually my rifle is a Smith and Wesson M&P 15T, and I just kind of set it up with a uh, A2 carry handle and an A2 style front sight. Since it's my personal rifle, you know, get to have more, um, you know, just practice time with it, even if it's just dry firing or just kind of working on it in a basement or in the garage. So it's, um, you know, it's a great, it's a good platform. Whether department issue or personal guns, it is still quality training under pressure for officers who may need it on the street. To me, I think it's just really getting into that mindset, that 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 combat mindset, and. Having that sense of urgency, but still maintaining poise and calm. Well, even though Quang was in it to win it, he didn't. Ed Dix of the Montgomery County Police Department placed first in the patrol division, while Border Patrol agent Ian Myers placed first in the tactical division. The two guys more ready than most for whatever comes on the beat. The NRA hosts six TPC matches around the country each year, and they're affordable thanks to your support of the NRA. And for officers watching, we've got a link for more information at shootingusa.com. Well, up next today, the story of the Colt model of 1877, now one of history's guns. And later, 
how to shoot a 60 pound steel target at 500 meters with a handgun. Out of all you'll spend on shooting this year, this is the most important, a membership in the NRA. Join at ShootingUSA.com and I'll pay $10 for you. It's that important. Conditions change. Your measure of success does not. The new Bushnell Elite Tactical DMR2I's illuminated G3 reticle allows you to adjust instantly to changing light to deliver exact holdovers at any range, all with effortless control. So you can conquer any target, at any distance, in any light, every time. The new Elite Tactical DMR2I, only from Bushnell. Shooting USA is brought to you by Les Bear Customs 1911s, hand fitted to perfection because you'll accept no less. It's hard to think of a more successful American revolver from the late 1800s than the single action army. Colt built nearly 200,000 of them from 1873 to 1900. And the six gun was so popular and so reliable that Colt's customers were slow to accept newer models, even a new model leading the way to modern revolvers. Colt introduced a double action six gun only four years after the single action. The model of 1877 is now one of history's guns. It was called the Thunderer and it went by lightning and a third the name of rainmaker one revolver really in three different calibers the 1877 colt the colt model 1877 double action revolvers was colt's first foray into the double action field 1877 it's kind of late by you know real standards because uh, there'd been lots of other double actions out prior to that especially in europe and they made some real humdingers there. But the 1877 was the first successful double action made in America. And in more than 30 years of production, Colt built 166,000. Good guys liked them. Bad guys liked them. Even a few bad gals. Here's stagecoach robber Pearl Hart with a lightning stuck in her gun belt and a single action in the holster on her hip. Gary is also shooting the Lightning, a nickname Colt never used. One of their distributors, Benjamin Kittredge, came up with uh, nicknames for them, called, uh, called them the Thunder, the one in 41 Colt. And then there was the Lightning in 38 Colt, that's the one we've got today. And then there was the Rainmaker in 32 Colt. The Lightning was far and away the most popular of the three. There's no question that it's a Colt. I mean, you take that away from it, and it looks just like a little miniature single action. The Lightning fires a black powder cartridge just as the single action does, though its smaller round 38 long Colt leaves much to be desired. It's a little 38 Colt round. Is it a barn burner now? It's no 38 special or, or, or 357 Magnum. It's kind of a mediocre 38 semi stopper. Still, the revolver does have its positive features. After all, it is a Colt. For somebody familiar with a single action back in the old days, it's just loaded the same way as a regular peacemaker. You just put the gun on half cock, open the loading gate, and drop in six rounds. Works great, practical. Now you're ready to go. The gun can be fired either single or double action. And when the shooting stops, you kick out the empties in a familiar way. You know, they made the ejection system basically identical to that of the, the single action. You know, it's just a half cock and poke it out with a ejector rod, spring-loaded ejector rod. That's all there was to it. The 1877 is more, though, than just a smaller version of the model of 73. And it's not just that this one is double action. Like, for instance, you know, the single action, you know, the cylinder stops around the side of the cylinder. This one, there on the back, and it's another one of the gun's kind of questionable features. This was the first Colt that actually had a, a spring-loaded cylinder pin release. Uh, that didn't come in on the single action until some time later. 
and uh, had a little, nice little bird's head grip, they called it, or the, the British called it a parrot beak grip. Uh, interestingly enough, this gun was very, very popular in England. Even so, the double action has a significant hidden flaw, a weak and unusual internal action, something Gary has experienced firsthand. I bought this gun, this is out of my own collection, and when I bought it, it kind of worked, like all of them, you see, most of them just kind of work or don't work at all. So I took it home and I said, well, how hard can it be? I'm pretty mechanically minded. I took this thing apart and I've never seen weirder looking springs and a weirder looking action in my whole life. Put it back together again and that was the end of it. Eventually, he found a gunsmith who could solve the six guns problems. Most gunsmiths won't touch these darn things. They just don't like fooling with them. And Gary's Model 1877 is in fine working order for now. The double action is very smooth. It's very comfortable and when it works, it's, it's a super little gun. Just one year after Colt introduced the Lightning, it debuted another new and improved revolver. The Model 1878 Double Action was known as the Frontier. But like the Model of 77, it never really caught on on the Western Frontier. One more victim of the great success of the Single Action Army. And still ahead, the pistols that shoot beyond a quarter mile. It's the World Championships of Handgun Metallic Silhouette. This is custom gun making, hand fitting, slide to frame, hand cutting the magwell, blending the surfaces of the slide, the frame, and the beaver tail. At every step, a Les Bear Custom 1911 is hand fitted to tolerances no CNC machine can match for match grade accuracy. And the Les Bear Custom 1911 is priced at one third of what you'd pay any other gun maker. See all the 1911s and rifles at lesbear.com. Shooting USA is brought to you by Blackhawk Honor as a way of life and by the M&P by Smith & Wesson, advanced by design. Silhouette shooting is a challenging discipline. Shooting as far as 500 meters with enough energy to knock down a 60 pound steel ram. I've suggested silhouette may be the most difficult of the rifle sports. But while we weren't paying attention, handgun silhouette competition has advanced to the same distances thanks to new cartridges and new guns. It's now really long shooting for the International Handgun Metallic Silhouette Association's World Championships. Summer in Oklahoma City, triple digit temperatures and high winds. But that's no problem for those competing in the International Handgun Metallic Silhouette Association's World Championships. They're shooting handguns like this at steel targets representing game animals as far out as 500 meters. Jim Fields has been the match director at the Oklahoma City Gun Club for 33 years. That new shooter comes out and he hears that bullet clang on the target, we pretty well got the hook in him. The hook is getting into a lot of people for this event. More than 120 shooters are here from the US, Canada, South America, and Australia. With some of the distances the same as NRA rifle silhouette, they're pushing the limits of what can be done in precision handgunning. You shoot targets clear out to 500 meters. Of course, you know, 200 meters makes their jaw drop, but 500 meters, they think they're lying to them. It is no lie, and it's amazing how accurate these guys and gals are. They're the best in the world shooting the different disciplines in IHMSA competition. Among them, Ultra 500, the first 500 meter event featured in the World Championships. Categories broken down by handgun action, sights, caliber, and shooting positions. To score a hit, the 60 pound ram, for instance, has to be knocked off its stand. If you hit the target and it does not fall off the stand, you're still putting a zero on the scorecard. You have 30 seconds left. Shooters are on the clock and have a set amount of time to fire on a bank of five targets. For the World Championships, 
in most every discipline, if 80 targets fall, that's a perfect score. And only the best in the world can do that. A lot of people can stay with them for four or five shots, but not for 80. They can't have the endurance and the concentration that they, they maintain. And all of that while shooting out to incredible distances for a handgun. The Ultra 500 discipline uses big bore guns and starts at 200 meters. Good hit. It's challenging enough to hit the chickens at 200. Good hit. After 20 shots at chickens, next up are the pigs at 300 meters. Then it's turkeys at 385. That's more than four football fields away. Now the Rams at 500 meters, which is almost a third of a mile. Traditional handgun silhouette competition is from 100 to 200 meters. But the folks at the IHMSA World Championships have helped to advance this sport, some say, thanks in part to very stable shooting positions, like the Creedmoor. Silhouette rules, by the way, say no part of the gun may touch the ground. Warren Alkire demonstrates the Creedmoor yeah. position. And then you want the elbow out that gives you somewhat of a tripod. That tripod provides stability for long shots and helps control recoil. And that's because when this gun fires, it's going to recoil easily for this, this much. The majority of the shooters at the Oklahoma City Gun Club shoot out of the Creedmoor or a related position colorfully named the dead frog. Where basically you cross your legs and would shoot across this way. And others shoot the field's flop position, created by Jim Fields 13 years ago. It's become popular as far away as Australia and Brazil, but you do have to control the recoil to keep the scope out of your eye. You use your elbow, and your five fingers as a tripod. And you rest the gun on top of your wrist and you drop your head onto the back of the gun just like you would a cheek piece on a rifle and press down on the finger that's underneath the grip, which stabilizes the back of the gun and allows a steadier position. The field's flop. One more example on how creative competition is advancing long-range handgun accuracy. So they're hitting targets in Oklahoma City that are far out. But there's a lot that goes into making those shots. This shooting discipline requires specific guns, the right cartridges, and precise loads. Coming up, we'll find out what works at the World Championships. The next evolution in single-stage press technology. The lock and load iron press from Hornady. The heavy-duty cast iron frame provides industry-leading superior strength, featuring the available automatic priming system, patented shell holder platform, accessory mounting deck, and lock and load bushing system. The Hornady lock and load iron press will deliver match accurate ammunition round after round, year after year. Shooting USA is brought to you by STI and the continuing evolution of the 1911 and by Comtac Everyday Carry Holsters. There are a lot of factors involved in winning in handgun metallic silhouette. First, decide which position to shoot from and that affects the choice of gun. Then choose the right cartridge and the right load and figure the wind. Then you're ready to shoot a heavy target which can be a long way out. There is no arguing in handgun silhouette shooting because the target either falls or it doesn't. It's a reactive target that something happens when you pull a trigger. Either you miss or you see the target go. And that's a big draw. A big draw for some, but too hard for others. It's difficult to knock over a 60 pound ram at 500 meters. And if the target is hit and doesn't fall? Well, that's uh, not very good. <laughs> that's called a ringer. And that's a zero on the scorecard instead of an X. But it does happen on a regular basis because of the many variables in this sport. 
like which cartridge to choose, what kind of load to go with, and accounting for the wind. But in the end, it comes down to this. You have to make a, a balance between the power uh, or the impact of the bullet uh, and the corresponding recoil. The majority of the shooters at the International Handgun Metallic Silhouette Association's World Championships shoot off their backs. That lets them go with a more powerful cartridge and a heavier load with plenty of recoil. Six-time champion Scott Thompson shoots a Remington XP100 chambered in Remington 260. During the competition, Scott competed in 15 classes and shot more than 1,200 rounds. Still, he admits that there is no such thing as the perfect cartridge. You sort of have to do some experimenting because like uh, some bullets are made to blow up real easy. The bullet blows up on the steel and it won't push it over. So you, you kind of have to play with it and see what works. Scott says another popular cartridge in the Unlimited and the production class is the 6.5 Benchrest. Others swear by the 7mm BR, and some shoot 308. Whatever the cartridge, Scott prefers a bullet weight of 120 to 130 grains. Bolt action Remington XPs are almost always the top finishers in the unlimited and unlimited any sight category, and that held true for the competition in Oklahoma City. The flop position is a relatively new innovation that provides a slightly more stable position and the opportunity to use higher power scopes like Jim Field's 40 power. But there is a trade-off to keep the scope out of the shooter's eye, a muzzle brake and a less powerful cartridge have to be used. The six millimeter bench rest has just enough power to knock over the rams, but has little margin if the wind, rail, or target conditions aren't ideal. Ah, uh, you got him right out on the nose, I think. <laughs> For silhouette shooting, accuracy and bullet energy are needed to knock down the targets. But there's a trick to dialing it in correctly. You back off of the velocity, so if you get it going too fast, it'll vaporize the bullet on the, on the uh, face of the target and not knock it over. And a lot of new shooters make the mistake of thinking they're having to go up on velocity, whereas they should be going down to some extent. Jim Fields should know he's won 22 world championships in 33 years. He says the key is a will to win and the desire to experiment. Jim is also proud of his Oklahoma range, the only one in the world that has a pneumatic auto reset system. And that Oklahoma range is open to you if you want to bring out your TC Encore or 500 Magnum. The association will make you welcome if you're ready to try some long shots. And up next, how are you going to carry that new 10 millimeter Colt? We've got an answer from Comtech. Introducing the M&P M2.0 by Smith & Wesson, enhanced for complete shootability. Featuring a new aggressive grip texture, the famous M&P Optimal Grip Angle, four interchangeable palm swell grips for nearly any hand size, a light, crisp trigger with a clear tactile reset. Everything you love about the M&P pistol made even better. The new M&P M2.0, advanced by design. Shooting USA is brought to you by Colt. Built one at a time, proven every round. A couple of weeks ago, we introduced Colt's return of the Delta Elite, chambered in 10 millimeter. John ran it through a test session at the range and found it quite comfortable to shoot because the near magnum power of the 10 millimeter is offset by the weight of the full size all steel design. It weighs in at two and three quarter pounds, loaded and chambered. So how are you gonna carry it if you want that power for personal protection? 
Well, CompTech has one answer. Their outside the waistband international model. This is actually their premier competition holster that facilitates a quick draw with the front cutout. And you've seen CompTech Pro Randy Rogers using it successfully with her 1911, although not chambered in 10 millimeter. Now, with the weight of the Delta Elite, I'm going to also suggest one of CompTech's reinforced cowhide belts to hold up your pants and carry the weight of the gun without twisting, thanks to an internal layer of kydex that reinforces the structure. And you'll notice the belt is cut on a contour to match your shape and not wrinkle as it wears in. The International Holster is $65. The reinforced belt in your choice of color and taper is $85 from Comtech. That's short for competition and tactical. Well, if you've spent any time on the range, chances are you've seen this move, the gallon Ziploc bag of ammo. I know I've done it, this one is mine. This is one of those things that works until it doesn't, and that day is a bad time. But Blackhawk has the solution. This is the GoBox 30 Cal. This multi-purpose utility bag has the same internal space as a traditional 30 Cal ammo can. The closure is roll up and clip, so you can be sure whatever's inside isn't getting out. The heavy duty wraparound handles will hold up no matter how heavy you load this bag. The base is reinforced and padded, and there's a hook and loop badge holder. This is handy if you've got multiples so you can identify what's inside different calibers or different loads. Available in black or coyote tan, the Blackhawk GoBox 30 Cal is 38 bucks. Here's an interesting question. What do you do for an optic if you found an AK that shoots tight enough to warrant one? Well, Bushnell has the answer. This is the AK Optics 1 to 4 by 24 variable power rifle scope. It's built on a 30 millimeter tube for superior light gathering. All of the lenses are multi-coated, making this rugged optic both fog and waterproof. The reticle is a BDC designed around the flight characteristics of the 7.62x23 cartridge, and it's on the second focal plane. The AK Optics 1-4 retails right at $350. Well, here's another question. Have you been gripping your carry gun wrong all along? Coming next, Julie Golub shows us the right way. Out of all you'll spend on shooting this year, this is the most important, a membership in the NRA. Join at ShootingUSA.com and I'll pay $10 for you. It's that important. On March 29th, 1911, the armed forces adopted a pistol that would change the world. For decades to come, men and women relied on the most trusted pistol in history as they fought the toughest battles to protect our freedom. Today, we celebrate another great victory, introducing the all-new Colt Competition Pistol, designed for heroes, created for champions. We didn't just make history, we're still making it. Shooting USA is brought to you by Les Bear Customs 1911s, hand fitted to perfection because you'll accept no less. Those of us who carry concealed know the smaller, convenient guns have bigger felt recoil, even with my Smith & Wesson J frame. But the small guns are easier to control when you grip your gun correctly. So Smith & Wesson Team Captain Julie Golub is here to show us the right way to grip that carry gun for both revolvers and semi-autos. The smaller and lighter the gun, the more it's going to recoil. Those are the laws of physics when it comes to shooting firearms designed for concealed carry, and it's why the fundamental shooting skill of proper grip is so important. So many shooters think that they have the proper grip down and move on to fundamentals like trigger control and sight alignment, but it's always a good idea to go back and evaluate your grip to make sure that you're doing it properly or make little modifications to help you shoot better. Let's start with revolvers. First, this Smith & Wesson J-Frame revolver has a nice small grip, and you want to make sure that you get as high up along the back as possible to control that recoil. Now, the one thing you want to remember, though, is you want to make sure that you have enough finger on this trigger for that long double action pull. So you may need to adjust a little bit so you get nice, good trigger finger placement and you can squeeze the trigger smoothly.
As I'm shooting, notice how high my strong hand is on the back of the gun. Keeping it nice and high allows me the leverage to control the recoil better. Now let's bring the support hand into play. Pistol shooters have a background of a bent thumb forward grip. Revolver shooters like that thumb over thumb technique both work, but the important thing to remember is you want to make sure your thumbs stay away from the cylinder. As you can see, the support hand not only helps to make you steadier, it works to control recoil. Try both grip styles to see what works best for you. I prefer the thumbs forward technique. Okay, that was the revolver grip. Now let's move on to pistols. It's important to get that same high grip along the back of the gun like so, and that's gonna help you control that recoil. You also wanna keep your thumbs high so you can manipulate any safeties. And then you're gonna bring your support hand into play. This is where you wanna bend your wrist forward a little bit, give it a little bit of a cant, so that you can add that extra bend to help you control recoil. You're gonna bring your support hand into play, and notice there's no space between my dominant hand and my non-dominant hand. And then again, I'm keeping those thumbs nice and forward. A thumbs forward grip on either this semi-auto or a revolver not only helps you control recoil, it helps you index more quickly. Simply throw your thumbs forward and on target and you'll be able to see the sights faster. Here's my last tip for the support hand grip. Instead of squeezing the grip with your support hand, think about pinching your fingers into the palm of your hand. And that's gonna make a vise on the front of the grip and allow you to control that muzzle rise. Don't overlook the importance of having a proper grip. Take the time to reevaluate your grip so that you can shoot your best. Thanks, Julie. And if you want to study your thumbs forward grip for the autoloaders, see it again in the pro tips section and find more information about tactical police competition if you're an officer looking for more training or where to shoot metallic handgun silhouette if you're interested in going really long. Find all the info at shootingusa.com. For all of us, I'm Jim Scout. Shoot safely, shoot often, and keep them in the ten ring.